Every week, there's another thing I have to make a password for, another thing I have to sign up for, and it drains my bank account, and I'm just so sick of it! This is Will. Will is upset because streaming services are progressively becoming more and more like cable television. Do you feel like Will? It like makes me furious. Okay. Sorry to cut you off, but it makes me <laughs> furious. Do you hate rising prices? And if you want to watch those shows, you have to give them seven bucks a month, 15 bucks a month. Do you wish you had more control over your streaming service? Everything used to be all on one platform. Do you hate that ads are making a comeback? It now is becoming even worse than cable television. If you share any of those frustrations, then come along with me. I went off on a journey and I've come back with this video, discussing things from the present day to the history to the technology and regulation that surrounds streaming in order to answer the question, why in the hell would streaming just become cable television again? It makes me so... It makes me furious. <laughs> when people say that streaming has become more like cable, I think they're generally referring to three key features of cable television that streaming once promised to free us from, only to recreate them in the last handful of years. First is that prices are rising. Streaming was originally introduced to households across the world as a single affordable monthly plan that for just a few bucks a month would get them access to all the content they could ever want to watch. In recent years though, prices have ballooned. Look at Netflix, for example, which has seen prices double across almost every plan. Their standard streaming plan, which was introduced at $8 a month, will now run you 16, and the premium plan, which cost just $12 as recently as 2016, will now run you $22.99 a month at the end of 2023. It's worth noting that both of those price increases also well outpace inflation over the same time periods. And if it feels like price increases are becoming more and more common, it's because they are. Price increases have become the norm across platforms, seen here for all major streaming services across their most recent price hike, which averaged a 21% increase. If you were to have all of these streaming services, you'd end up like the one in four Americans who are paying more for streaming than the average cable cost. For those that think that that direct comparison isn't fair, I'll admit that you might be onto something. Deloitte found, for instance, that the average millennial pays just $54 a month for streaming, which is cheaper than the average cable cost. However, you have to keep in mind that that statistic doesn't take into account individual rentals, like uh, a $4 movie on Amazon every once in a while, or the cost that you pay to your ISP to access the high-speed internet that makes streaming possible. And we shouldn't expect price hikes to stop anytime soon, as streaming services are all racing towards profitability, experiencing billion-dollar losses in some cases. As of 2022, just Netflix and Hulu are profitable, which means that younger services like Max and Disney Plus, both founded in 2019, still have a bit of a ways to go before they make shareholders happy. As one firm put it, the era of streamflation is here, and we shouldn't expect these price increases to be a mere flash in the pan, given the surrounding economic circumstances. So, the era of cheap streaming is dead, or at the very least, dying. But surely all of those extra costs come with the modern benefits of streaming, right? Any show I want at the touch of a button, right? Well, maybe not. In some very important ways, I think that consumers are actually losing some of the control that they once had. Streaming once promised eternal access to a large catalog of content wherever we went, a kind of digital frontier for freedom. However, changes in licensing, ownership, and permissions are threatening to reduce that control across the board. Let's start with licensing. Generally, if a service doesn't own a piece of media, then they pay a licensing fee to the owner in order to stream it on their platform. This can be a really big expense though, and after price hikes, removing titles is the best way for a streaming service to reduce their overall costs. What this ends up meaning is that if a show doesn't drive enough retention, engagement, or new subscriptions, then platforms are really likely to just stop paying to carry it, and you will lose access to something that you once had. And this is compounded by increasing media concentration through mergers and acquisitions. Disney, for example, now owns Hulu and ESPN and ABC and Fox and Lucas film and Marvel and Pixar and National Geographic and my house probably. Uh, Amazon owns MGM and don't even get me started on Warner Bros. Discovery. I think that that is the stupidest company name since Keurig Dr. Pepper. As companies merge and acquire one another, ownership of individual properties changes, meaning that they move between services more often, or they go to a new service that exists as the consequence of a merger or acquisition. And this often results in you needing to pay more money to access the same content you once had control over. 
offer. Infinity War, for example, used to be on Netflix, but it's now on Disney+. Friends used to be on Netflix, but now you need Max to see that. Titles leaving Netflix has become so passe that there are entire blogs run by some guy you went to college with dedicated to tracking this stuff. Similarly, the merger that led to the creation of Max saw many titles, some of which were streaming originals, disappear from the platform entirely, going to other services where you have to pay to rent them. Now, keep in mind, these weren't particularly heavy-hitting titles, but what happens if something a little bigger than Yabba Dabba Dinosaurs becomes unavailable? And even if the titles that we want are on a platform that we pay to access, our control over them can still be limited by changes in permissions. Who could forget the Netflix password sharing crackdown, which saw Netflix totally rewrite the script on what streaming services were supposed to be. By limiting the number of places that you can use your Netflix account, Netflix just declared that streaming was no longer going to be a frontier for digital digital freedom. You can no longer easily share with your kids at college or long distance partner or really anyone outside a traditional nuclear family without incurring extra costs. And it should be noted that other platforms like Disney Plus are already poised to follow suit. Once pitched as a liberation from clunky, antiquated cable, streaming has now started to reinvent the wheel on restricting access to content. <sighs> All right. That isn't it. The prices are a little bit higher and the access is a little bit worse than it once was, but please just at least tell me that we aren't gonna have the worst part of cable come back, right? Please tell me that we, we aren't gonna have <gasps> advertising is back. Though it once seemed we had reached a post-ad media ecosystem thanks to streaming, we are now all too familiar with lengthy advertising segments, even when we already pay for a subscription. Ad-supported plans have started popping up, and though they're cheaper, they have ads, which is obviously fucking awful and horrifying. Like, I, I can't even begin to explain to you the existential dread that I feel when listening to this Whopper commercial. Why did they say Whopper so many times? What, what, do they think that this is going to make me want to eat a Whopper? What do you mean have it my way? I have no control over this Burger King. What do you mean I rule? Burger King, do you think I give a shit about what you think about me? Do you think I care about your opinion? I'm not thrilled by advertisements. I've had streaming since I was a kid and so I've actually lived a good chunk of my life just kind of free from ads. At one point that presented a unique divergence in the history of media where it seemed like, you know, our generation might get free of these constant reminders of the hellscape in which we live but that dream is kind of dead now. As more and more services race towards profitability, ad-supported plans will become dominant, and ad-free plans are going to get so expensive that you will probably not be able to afford them anymore. There's just simply too much money to be left on the table with advertising. Just today, before I sat down to record this actually, I saw a headline that Amazon Prime has just announced that their current plans will all start to include ads, and that you're going to need to pay an extra $2.99 a month to go back to the ad-free service that you just had. As I covered in my content addiction video, more eyeballs is more money, and they already have your eyeballs, so why wouldn't they try and make some more money? And aside from joking about the annoyance of ads, we should note that they do literally make content worse, as you are no longer the primary customer. Advertisers are. Netflix, for example, finally started releasing their streaming data this year, not because of viewer pressure, but because they need to prove to advertisers that they are a good place to sell a product. And as they explained in their October 2022 press call announcing the ad supported plan, their goal is to increase membership with a cheap plan to then increase ad revenue across the board. They also seek to satisfy advertisers by opting for formulaic, engagement driven content at a high volume rather than smaller pieces of risky, interesting, artistic media. This shift leads to standardizations like the Netflix look, where all Netflix shows kind of look the same due to stringent technical requirements. Most shows on Netflix are shot with one of two cameras and in a very limited number of formats because Netflix forces creators to do so. Ads directly incentivize this copy-pasted content mill behavior, and it makes the average show worse even though these platforms are capable of truly creating something much better when they try. So here we stand in 2023 with streaming, it seems, slowly reverting to cable. Prices are going up, control is going down, and ads are on the rise. Not to mention the things that I couldn't get to in this section. Like, if Disney owns everything, isn't it all just gonna come in like a massive bundle that will look just like a cable plan and cost probably a bajillion dollars? I don't know, just throwing it out there. Looking at this, we may start to ask ourselves, how did we ever have a golden age of streaming when it's so clear now that it was unprofitable and unsustainable for all of these companies? How did we ever have that cheap $10 a month payment for total access over an ad-free catalog of content? 
to answer that question, we're going to have to do the history part of the video where we go back in time and look at how this whole mess got started. I remember like very vividly, there was a time in like maybe 2015 that you were like, like we were maybe in your house and you yeah. were like, they're going to do this and then they're, they're, everyone will make one and then you buy it, it all in a like, bundle. I, and then... I believe Hulu had like just come out because uh -huh. it was obviously Netflix first. In 2009, Hulu produced this ad campaign that has aged really poorly. In this ad spot, we see Alec Baldwin play a devious alien overlord who deploys Hulu across the world because, as they joked, the deal they were offering was so good, it could only be the result of an evil plot to take over the world. It's aged poorly for two main reasons. Um, one being that Hulu kind of sucks and they haven't really taken over much of anything. And the other being that there was a plan going on in the background to take over the world through media a savvy, calculated effort to extract all the value that they could and run away with the profits. And sitting at the forefront was Netflix. Netflix is enough of a household name that you've probably heard the history once or twice at this point. They started out as a DVD rental service, mailing little red envelopes to houses, which allowed them to corner the market in at-home entertainment before they made the pivot to streaming, where they revolutionized content for the next generation by delivering video on demand over the internet. This version of events, however, misses a lot. I'm going to suggest in this section of the video that if we want to understand why we no longer bask in the golden age of streaming, then we need to stop conceptualizing Netflix as a neutral party or distributor of content, and instead understand them as an antagonistic force to the existing media market with a long-term plan. After all, they're not a media company, they're a tech company. Right? To tell you the story, I'm going to be adding some context and analysis to the events that are laid out best in the history section of Netflix's Wikipedia page. Credit to the editors. This is Mark Randolph and Reed Hastings. In the 90s, they were working together at a company called Pure Software, which Hastings had founded to create debugging tools for software engineers. In 1996, they were acquired for $750 million, which was the largest acquisition in the history of Silicon Valley at the time, and provided Hastings the seed money for Netflix. Citing inspiration from a $40 late fee at Blockbuster, the pair decided to get into the new DVD rental business. Now, streaming didn't exist yet, so we'll get to that a little later, but this DVD rental era saw the birth of two themes that we're going to need to pay attention to if we want to understand what's happening today. First, we should note the tech of it all. These were two savvy tech entrepreneurs who had done the Silicon Valley two-step one or two times before, and they were taking a bet on a new technology, becoming early adopters of DVDs, which were only about a year old at this time, to see if they could attempt to corner a stake in the infant market. Second, the DVD rental days launched a conflict between Netflix and traditional media, as Netflix made an entire business model on cutting into the DVD sales of large media companies. Physical sales were a much bigger piece of the pie in these days than they are now, peaking at $16 billion in 2005, which, for reference, was almost twice the domestic box office that year. Cutting into those sales actually mattered, and established an antagonism that would carry on for years to come. Later down the line, we would see deals attempting to remedy this, like a 28-day rental delay, described here in a Warner Bros. press release as a win-win by future Netflix CEO Ted Sarandos. It created an agreement that Netflix wouldn't rent DVDs out for the first 28 days after their release, which allowed Warner Bros. to profit off DVD sales and Netflix to maintain favorable relationships. But that specific deal didn't come until 2010, and was a little bit more of a consolation prize to the film industry than anything else. Though Netflix had been cutting into the physical media market since 1999, DVD sales plummeted between 2007 and 2008, falling 26% in one year alone, constituting a $4 billion loss. How did that possibly happen, you ask? Well, uh, th this video is about streaming, so yeah, it was streaming, at least in part. Starting in 2007, Netflix offered a streaming video plan, which started modestly with a limited catalog, but soon began to expand. However, Netflix continued their previous themes of investing in new tech and cutting into the media market. In 2008, they smartly extended their streaming plan to all DVD renting subscribers, which quickly led to them cornering all of streaming. When media companies began to notice the demand for streaming from consumers, they were lining up to cut deals with Netflix. In 2010, and this led to billion dollar agreements to put some of the biggest movies ever onto the platform. And what kicked this trend into a frenzy was the moment when media began to see the power that internet could have for distributing their content. Breaking Bad was the first cable show to receive the so-called Netflix boost or Netflix effect. 
Binge-watching fans supercharge the show's popularity, quintupling viewership from 2 million to 10 million in just one season, changing the way we conceive of how media becomes popular overnight. All of a sudden, this complex, intense drama was being followed closely by millions of households across America as they sat down to binge season after season after season in anticipation of the oncoming finale. It's not a stretch to say that this is one of the most important moments in recent media history. Breaking Bad is iconic, and Netflix helped to make it as big as it is. That's almost undeniable. After this, every piece of media wanted to be on Netflix, wanted to be the next binge-worthy viral success. This was Netflix reaching the zenith of their power, and this was also the golden age of streaming. From roughly 2012 to 2016, Netflix was a one-stop shop for consumers who wanted to have a single monthly plan to access the most content possible. Fueled by a new understanding of what the internet could do for media, Netflix became the only game in town. And for the viewer, it was a pretty good deal. But good things can't last. This is the point in the story where things start to get a little weird. Up to this point, I've been saying that we needed to follow two through lines, right? That Netflix was a tech company and that they were cutting into the revenue of media companies. But what happens when that tech company kind of becomes a media company? And when all the media companies that it was cutting into try to become tech companies as well. Our boundaries start to blur and our analysis starts to get more difficult as Netflix raced to become like media companies and media companies raced to become like Netflix. Over the last decade, Netflix pivoted into originals like Orange is the New Black, House of Cards, Stranger Things, all of the big names. They've dropped some really great shows, honestly, including some of my favorite pieces of television ever created. And I don't like to think of them this way, but they've kind of become the media companies that they once stole pie from. Recently, they've joined the MPAA and AMPTP. They get Oscar nominations. I mean, hell, between 2018 and 2023, Netflix went from 8% original content to 55% original content. Led by Ted Sarandos, Modern Netflix has become a media company. At the same time, driven by jealousy over Netflix's success, every media company sat down and had the same idea. What if we hired some software engineers and threw money at the problem until we were Netflix too, but with our own content? In the last decade, everyone has made a streaming service. There's Disney+, Plus, ESPN+, Plus, CNN+, Plus, Max, Discovery+, Plus, Peacock, Paramount+, Plus, Stars, which is also called Lionsgate+, Plus, Quibi, Tubi, Ludo, Pluto, and Fubo. And now, a history that started with a tech company causing trouble for media companies ends with that tech company becoming a media company and all of the media companies becoming tech companies as well. I'm so tired. So what do I make of all of this? Our current media moment is one of constant chaos and flux, and that is all thanks to streaming. Streaming has changed everything. As of this year, streaming accounts for 38% of all television viewing, more than any other distribution method. It's the most popular way to watch content on your television, which, as I've discussed on this channel before, still accounts for over half of all leisure time in the United States. Netflix set out to take over the world of media, to capture revenue until they were the only game in town, and they did it. And for a few years, between roughly 2012 and 2016, this meant that they were the biggest and best in town, and that that was actually briefly good for consumers. I hope you can see now, though, how this golden age of streaming and the conditions that surrounded it were fundamentally unsustainable. I'd argue that Ted Sarandos' idea to pursue original content was really savvy from a business perspective, if only because it demonstrates that he understood the game that they were playing. He understood that they weren't going to be able to keep the cash cow of streaming all to themselves, and that when other companies caught in on the game, they were going to need their own content if they wanted to stick around. So they made a plan to become a media company in their own right before they got bullied out of the space by someone like like Disney taking all of their content. This is why when I try to understand Netflix, I think about it kind of like the final season of Succession. It's tech meeting media, a battle of the giants, old and new. And understanding it through this lens of two Silicon Valley bros breaking into an existing industry, I start to hear some whispers in the distance of how we might try and respond to this problem as it develops. After all, stuff like this has happened before, right? I I'm an actor. Mm -hmm. I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. It's no secret to anyone that it takes a shitload of people to make a movie or to make a TV show. Yeah. That's why the credits go on for forever. There was a structure to make sure 
that that money was distributed fairly to the people who were making them that money. When new technology comes out, any new technology, the first thing people are gonna do with it is find a way to um, rip other people off yeah. by using it. And, and that's what we were seeing with streaming. I'm here in New York where it is approximately speaking really fucking cold. So I'm gonna be reading this next section off of my phone. I, I hope that you'll forgive me for that. I live in New York and not to be really annoying, but New York is very cool. Part of the reason why it's cool is that it's so large and populous. New York is really big, like really, really big. And this size allows it to model policy like uh, a small or even medium sized or large state. And this year there were two interesting policies that the city rolled out about how to regulate tech within city limits that I want to tell you about. First was the effective Airbnb ban. In September, Local Law 18 made it so that short-term rentals in the city can only be done by registered hosts who live in the place that they're renting and are there during the term of the rental, while also limiting the number of short-term rental guests to just two. You might say, wait, doesn't this effectively ban Airbnb in New York City? And to that I'd say, like, yeah, it, it, it does. And I think that that's good. Let's talk about why. 30% of Airbnb listings are owned by mega hosts, which are often management companies that have large real estate holdings that they use for short-term rentals. I like this law, Local Law 18, because it de-incentivizes these large firms from snapping up whole buildings to turn them into Airbnbs. If you need to live in the units and be there during the rentals, then you can't be a management company. You need to be a living human being who owns a home. This helps New Yorkers by limiting what Forbes calls the Airbnb effect. You see, since short-term rentals are so much more profitable than long-term rentals, like a standard lease on an apartment, savvy real estate investment would dictate that you should turn your 10-unit building into 10 short-term rentals rather than 10 long-term ones. The problem is, though, that this reduces the number of available units for people who actually live in New York, because they're all Airbnbs. This slowly drives up prices and pushes locals further away from the heart of the city where they might work. For more on this Airbnb effect, Adam Something has a really excellent video discussing this same thing in Prague. The point you need to know for this video, though, is that New York used policy and regulation in order to tip the scales of the real estate market in favor of local renters and away from investors, management groups, and tech companies. And I think that that's really good. There's also been a second quieter example of this same thing in the city that didn't make quite the national splash that the Airbnb ban did. In November, New York Attorney General Letitia James announced a nine-figure settlement with Uber and Lyft, declaring that their gig work model was not actually a cool way for drivers to earn some extra money, but rather a way for Uber to avoid paying its drivers a minimum wage and to circumvent key labor regulations like sick leave and payment into unemployment insurance. This was another example of the tech industry using smoke and mirrors to avoid existing regulations and protections in the industry they were operating in. By introducing a new model of work wrapped up in a shiny app, Uber tried to say their drivers were not the same as the drivers of days gone by. No longer was the person driving you from the airport an employee of a company, rather they were a contractor, obviously no longer entitled to a minimum wage. For more on this gig economy example, I can point you to this very good video by Tom Nicholas on the subject. But for this video, I bring up this example for the exact same reason I bring up Airbnb. Regulation was used to remedy the way that the tech industry had dodged around existing agreements with an eye towards protecting workers and communities. Policy progressed to meet technology. More on this later. Now, how do we get this back to streaming? Well, the broader trend here is discussed best by Jonathan Taplin, author of Move Fast and Break Things, a 2017 book discussing how tech wriggles out of existing regulations in every sector it sets up in. In the Airbnb example, there already existed real estate and hospitality industries that had certain agreements on zoning, price, and more with their local communities. Airbnb came in and allowed those with enough money to get around those restrictions under the guise of being a new thing short-term rentals enabled by peer-to-peer -peer sharing. In the Uber example, there already existed delivery and driving services in major metropolitan areas, and Uber got around existing laws and agreements by saying they were a new thing, a ride-sharing service powered by gig work. Taplin shares tons of other examples like this. For example, discussing in this 2018 talk at the John Adams Institute how digital media hurt musicians. After the collapse of vinyl and CD royalties in response to music streaming services, musicians like Levon Helm, seen here with Bob Dylan in the band, ended up dying in relative poverty, despite receiving millions of streams on YouTube, Spotify, and Napster. 
These new platforms shrank the total consumer spend on recorded music by 71% between 1998 and 2014, and they kept what little revenue remained for themselves. And listen, I, I know that there are problems with the music industry. Copyright and royalties and licensing are all imperfect systems. But over several decades, collective agreements ensured that labor was compensated. I'm not comfortable saying that it's a good thing that Spotify disrupted that model, even if it increased consumer access and lowered prices. And I'm even more uncomfortable that every tech company depends on doing this exact type of disruption, including Netflix. Proper compensation for work on streaming shows was a key issue, for example, in the WGA strike this year. Residual pay models negotiated in the 2007 strike didn't anticipate streaming, and so they left writers on streaming shows earning a tiny piece of what they would make on cable television. This is also true for actors. Remember how I talked about Breaking Bad on Netflix being one of perhaps the most important moments in recent media history? Well, Netflix has never paid Aaron Paul for his work on that show because they don't have to. Technological progress is good, don't get me wrong. But when it redistributes wealth in ways that have lasting impacts on workers and communities, we need to address it. New York is attempting to solve these problems with regulation, and I think that's good. So if we want to fix streaming, we just need to regulate it, right? How hard could that be? At the end of the day, movies and TV and stuff on these streaming services, it's art. And people made it for people so as to say something about being people, that's a wonderful, beautiful thing. And people should have access to that. If we all agree that it's good and, and it contributes to society, then the people who produced it should live in comfort and security, right? Let's talk big idea and potential solutions now. The bigger picture here is that streaming, like all new tech, allows large media corporations to dance around regulation. By classifying themselves as something different from cable, they're able to get around decades of regulatory history, even when the information comes into your house over the exact same cable. This means that companies are going to prefer streaming as a way to deliver content because of the regulatory advantage. That, to me, is a problem that needs to be solved, but you might be a little more suspicious of that. You might say, well, what regulations are they really getting around? How big of an advantage could it be to be classified as streaming rather than cable? The short answer is that they stand to gain a lot. To get to the long answer and understand everything that they do gain, we're going to need to get into the historic relationship between cable operators and the FCC, or Federal Communications Commission. This video is going to end with a regulatory history section, but don't worry, I'm, I'm going to take care of you. There will be a timeline, and there's no quiz, and I promise it's really interesting. Our story starts with the invention of cable in the 1940s, when people started running antennas to catch broadcast signals and then distribute them with cables to their local communities. In 1965, the FCC first regulated the distribution of cable using powers that it claimed it had under the Communications Act of 1934, and the Supreme Court agreed they had those powers in 1968. So we start off with two basic facts. Cable operators exist, and the FCC can regulate them. From this point on, the entire history is essentially a power struggle between these two groups, as we try to figure out who can regulate what and how much. In 1976, the FCC expanded regulations, requiring cable operators to carry signals for public access programming. But by 1979, cable operators had struck back in a case called FCC v Midwest Video Corp, where courts determined that requiring they carry public access was actually outside the FCC's jurisdiction. Eventually, Congress got around to passing the Cable Communications Policy Act in 1984, which was the first legislation passed on cable. It helped make cable popular in American households, but most of that grew growth and increasing popularity was only possible because the regulations in the Cable Act were too weak to protect consumers and local governments. Cable expanded because there was money to be made. There were lacking price restrictions, even in monopoly markets, which led cable prices to outpace inflation by three times in the 1980s. And though the Cable Act had originally solidified protections for public access channels, those were ruled unconstitutional in 1985. So by the early 90s, the FCC really needed a win, as did consumers. And they would get that through the cable television 
Television Consumer Protection and Competition Act of 1992. This brought back price regulations and firmly established that operators and broadcasters had to carry public access programming. In 1996, there were further developments through the Telecommunications Act, which changed who could become a cable operator, which eventually led to concentration in AOL, Time Warner, and Viacom. However, this act also established the Universal Service Fund, which operators pay into to support broadband and telecommunication infrastructure. I don't need you to remember all of the details that I just went through. What I do need you to remember, though, is that those 40 years of regulatory history that I just went to do not apply to streaming. Streaming outlets don't need to pay into the Universal Service Fund, uh, meaning they don't contribute to the infrastructure that makes their very revenue possible. They also aren't required to carry public access programming, meaning that local media is slowly dying. And to top it all off, streaming is being used as a justification to weaken pricing regulations across the board. At the same time, antitrust has been severely weakened in film and television. All of this means that for media companies, streaming is a pretty sweet deal. And whoever comes out on top of all of these streaming platforms that we see right now is going to have a fucking field day, people. Remember earlier when I was talking about how these media companies were becoming tech companies and tech companies were becoming media companies? As far as all of these people see it, who cares? Start streaming, we're free from the FCC, no regulations. Cards on the table, I think that this is really bad. We've already talked about how it hurts the people who are creating media, as well as the people who are consuming media, and now we also have to contend with the fact that because of what is essentially a loophole, we are going to lose local media, as well as billions of dollars for public infrastructure, and we'll still be forced to watch, oh my god, no! You might be asking now though, is anyone gonna do anything about this? This is Jessica Rosenworcel, the current chair of the FCC. In her time there, she has generally supported equitable broadband access. This means things like being pro-net neutrality and pro-increasing broadband access for education. I like those stances. So I was a little surprised to hear how hands-off she's been when it comes to regulating streaming. She's gone so far as to publicly say that she doesn't think the FCC has the power to regulate streaming, citing that she doesn't think the Cable Acts of 1984 or 1992 empower them to do that. If you're anything like me, you're probably a little shocked to hear that because like, you know, Jessica, you're the chair of the FCC. If you don't have that power, who does? But there is a bigger picture here. The interplay of federal agencies, Congress, and the Supreme Court is a little fraught in 2023. For the last 40 years, federal agencies have enjoyed a privilege known as Chevron deference. The basic idea is that when Congress empowers a federal agency, like the FCC or the EPA, to do something, the Supreme Court will defer to the agency's interpretation of the law. This means that when Congress passes the Clean Air Act, the EPA interprets and implements it. When Congress passes the Cable Act, the FCC interprets and implements it. There are some flaws with this system, but I think it is preferable in my view to the current stated alternative. It's generally more efficient than asking Congress to enumerate every last tiny power it wants to grant a federal agency. And it also generally means that decisions are made by experts in a given field who have been empowered by people that I participate in electing. And the alternative is Clarence Thomas. Chevron deference has been significantly weakened by the current U.S. Supreme Court through a line of reasoning known as the Major Questions Doctrine. Essentially, if it's even a little unclear if a federal agency has the power to do exactly what it's doing, the Supreme Court has given itself the power to answer that question when it is of significant political or social importance. What this ends up meaning is that nine unelected lifetime appointees have given themselves the power to disregard expert opinion kind of just on vibes. This video isn't about the Supreme Court, so I'm not going to get too in the weeds here. The important thing to know, though, is that Jessica Rosenworcel knows that the Supreme Court wouldn't be on her side if she tried to use the Cable Act to regulate streaming. This is why she's called on Congress to pass legislation explicitly empowering the FCC to do so. I think the only way that we're going to get out of this is with that piece of legislation. When cable got too expensive in the 80s, the Cable Act of 1992 regulated prices. When streaming gets expensive now, we should have the Streaming Act to do the same thing. We need something that regulates price, that protects public access, ensures that these companies pay their fair share into the public infrastructure that makes their revenue possible, that prevents concentration, and dozens of other things that I am unable to think of on my own. Without a piece of legislation like this, monopolization will continue, prices will rise, consumers will have a worse deal, and workers will not get paid as much as they could. I don't see a way around it. If I'm being honest though, there's something a little bit bigger than a single piece of legislation going on. 
the streaming act would be great, but it doesn't capture the saddest part of this all to me, which is that I grew up believing that streaming was just the next step in our societal advancement. We developed a way to get more content to more people more conveniently and for less money. So of course that would be shared with the people because that's what society is for, you know, progress. But thinking this way is what has allowed this same harm to happen again and again and again. When asked about why Netflix made the pivot from just distribution to creating their own content, Reed Hastings says in interview after interview after interview that they are simply emulating what cable operators did in the 80s and 90s. Create a new technology to get around regulation, make a ton of money, and then use that money to make your own content so you can stay in the game. This has all happened before, and it will happen again. Rest assured that even if we regulate streaming, even if we regulate it really well, there will come a day when something new comes around. Picture 15 years from now, someone like me trying to explain to you why your brain media tube is repeating all the sins and inefficiencies of streaming. If that thought makes you uncomfortable, it might be because you understand that there is a deeper problem in the way that we relate to our technology. I hope we pass a streaming act, but I hope more that our social development is finally able to outpace our technological progress. I hope that we find intuitive and just ways to prevent the harms caused by new technologies, even as progress continues. We can't just keep scrambling to recover each time something new comes around, barely able to tell if everyone is okay. Streaming is becoming like cable. But given the circumstances, I hope you can see how this was almost inevitable. The lesson then can't just be to learn that there is a single problem we must solve. The lesson is that this will happen again, unless we learn to do better than we do today. I hope you liked this video because uh, this is the end of it. So it would be weird if you got here without liking it the whole time, but you know, I don't want to judge. Um, I hope that you'll subscribe and give the video a like and maybe come around next time when I put out another new video. It would help quite a bit. This one got a bit bigger than I was expecting. The scale kind of ballooned out of control, but I had a lot of fun making it. And I think everything on the channel from here on out is going to start looking more like this. Thanks for watching.